Thank you very much. We will now take questions and uh, we will start with Politico. Thank you very much. I'm Lily from Politico. I have a question for both Admiral Bauer and for General Cavoli. The question is, given this new era of collective defense with the new regional plans and the new force model, what is your message to the allies, the majority of allies, who still don't meet the 2% GDP target for defense investment? And do you think that it is feasible to implement the new plans in a situation, in a setting where not all allies meet the 2% target? Thank you. There's two different things. So first is that this, the, the, the regional plans and the four structural requirements that come out of it is basically uh, the result of thinking that started with two threats, which is Russia and the terrorist groups. And then we looked together at what do we need to do to actually deter and defend against those two threats. And the regional plans are a follow-up on the deter and defend strategy and it's more and more detailed per region now. So we know more and more uh, and in more detail what we need to do to actually be able to, to do that. And the next step then is, is, and that's the four structure requirements, is that as a result of those plans, you, we, we will now be able to define which capabilities we need in all domains, space, cyber, land, air, maritime, uh, to actually execute those different tasks. So, in the end, the alliance, if all the nations are collectively doing what, we, what they have agreed with NATO, uh, then we are able to, de to properly deter and defend those two threats. So, this is the first time that we have an objective way from the threat to the, to the investment target, so to say, of the nations. And I think that is a that's a big change. And I think that will help to convince the nations to actually do what they have agreed with NATO. But of course, if nations need more time or nations have less money or there's all sorts of things that happen along the way, then it will have an impact of reaching that ideal situation. So the uh, executability of the plans is the result of not only the investments, but it's also on the forces that, are, that need to be available in the right number and in the, with the right readiness. It is, of course, the command and control. It is the authorities for, uh, for the Supreme Allied Commander of Europe. It is the plans in even more detail than they are presented and discussed today. And then, of course, it is the capabilities. So all that will take some time uh, to make sure that we get there. It is the result of more recruitment, it is the result of more training, it is the result of investments, and that will, whether we like it or not, will take some time. And part of that discussion is the money part, which is the, uh, the, the Defense Investment Pledge, which is part of the, uh, of the Vilnius uh, Summit, where there is now a political discussion on how much will the what will the def Defense Investment Pledge be. And of course, there is a connection between what the outcome of those discussions is, and all the work that we are, uh, that we are facing here with the four structural requirements. Chris. I had a very thorough answer constructed in my head, but the chairman, one by one, sentence by sentence, uh, covered everything. Uh, the only thing I would add is that um, I would emphasize his point that this is the first time in more than 30 years that we have an objective plans-based statement of requirements. And that's a real advantage for all nations in the alliance. It will give focus to their national defense planning uh, for collective defense purposes. So it is a, it is a very big advance. And, and if I may, I can just add that uh, uh, we are in charge to uh, to build this, this future uh, planning process in order either to integrate all the, uh, the elements coming from the operational parts, the uh, DDA family of plan, but also the mid-term and long-term uh, uh, perspective, and we've got many imperatives to, uh, to integrate. Over. Thank you. Next question for Wall Street Journal. 
Thank you very much. Dan Michaels with The Wall Street Journal. A question, I guess, for all of you. Uh, a significant portion of NATO's forward posture now depends on pre-positioning of equipment. Uh, and one of the things we've seen in Ukraine is the Ukrainians have been very effective at targeting uh, Russian logistics and, and supplies. And I'm curious what kind of lessons you're drawing from the war, uh, which obviously might be a very different situation than what NATO would face, uh, but in your thinking about some of the logistics. And also on logistics, you're talking about a lot of things related to troops and equipment, but one of NATO's weaknesses that's been identified over recent years is the sort of atrophying of a lot of logistics within Europe, uh, things like train cars to move tanks and heavy vehicles, and the lack of knowledge of infrastructure in, in the former Soviet bloc members, just because it was not necessary until recently. So I'm curious how that um, less obviously military element of uh, your planning fits into all of this. Thank you. Start by saying that uh, for the military, logistics and enablement is a very, very important part of the thinking. And as you rightfully said, uh, I think over many decades we have neglected uh, the larger scale logistics that is connected to collective defense, a larger scale conflict, because that conflict was not foreseen. And we were doing out of area operations that were having a significant logistic impact, but it was much more planable uh, than uh, with a war that we now see, for example, in, in, in Ukraine. So this is also part of the discussion on making sure that we understand what we need, which is part of the four structure requirements, and then making sure that we start in a very uh, planned way to move towards executability, because this will not be a light switch. This is not something that happened overnight. This requires infrastructural uh, investments. This will require uh, investments in uh, logistic um, capabilities that we do not have anymore, as you said, carts on the rail or more trucks or whatever, all the things you need in a, in a, in a large-scale uh, logistic uh, war effort. So it will take time, and uh, we can talk about it very long that it isn't ready yet, and, and, and all the people will most likely agree with you, but I think it is important that we now are coming to the point where we all recognize and realize that we need to do this, and that is what is on the table now. Chris. Yeah, thanks. Um, first, your question takes us right back to the plans, of course. Um, the force structure requirement that Admiral Bauer mentioned a couple of moments ago is not just tanks and ships and fighter planes. A large part of it is the required enablement, the required logistics, um, equipment, units, systems, um, and so forth. Second, our plans are actually divided into two categories. One is functional plans, uh, strategic subordinate plans. Um, the other is the regional plans. The regional plans dictate how we will describe, how we'll defend a particular geographic area. The functional plans, which we call SSPs, those actually describe how we will do things theater-wide, how we'll manage assets and things. One of the most important of those plans is the SSP for enablement. And that's written by General Alex Zolfranck and his staff down at the JSEC in Ulm. And their initial plan is now going to be revised in detail based on the delivery of the regional plans. So they designed the framework. Now the regional plans have been delivered. Now they have the ability to go in and put the numbers and the exact quantities of transportation equipment and things like that uh, necessary. So. Um, to the extent that there may have been logistics atrophy, um, um, we have now got a roadmap to bring ourselves uh, back, and this is a very important part of the investment plan. Thanks. 
and, and if, if, I, if, if I may, um, about talking about transformation, uh, uh, logistic and contesting environment, of course, digital transformation will help us to understand f uh, better and to decide faster. So it's uh, very important, and uh, especially in, in the logistics. Um, the second point is that uh, uh, logistic efficiency is relying on host nation. We have uh, support, we, we, we talked about that. Uh, we are increasing uh, the way we are leveraging private sector also, and it's so important, and we can talk about uh, uh, the data where needs to, uh, need to be where they need to, uh, to be, and of course, Starlink uh, has shown us uh, uh, a lot of things in, uh, in, in Ukraine. I must say that also that the emerging and disruptive technology, technology has to be leveraged also. We can talk about uh, the energy and synthetic fuel, for example, but also uh, spare parts in logistics is very important, and we can think about uh, 3D, 3D printing. And uh, to conclude, uh, I think that, uh, of course, we have to continue to work on the mobility with the European Union. Thank you very much. Next question is for Reuters. Andrew Gray from Reuters. Uh, Admiral Bauer, in your opening remarks, um, you mentioned that this uh, war has now been going on for 15 months when Russia had expected a three-day war. Uh, can you say something about um, the impact of that miscalculation on the Russian military? In other words, how do you judge how much the Russian military has been degraded and depleted by this ongoing campaign? And do you think that the recent Victory Day, Day parade in Moscow indicated that perhaps Russia is running low on some equipment and ammunition? Well, I think every party in a war will have similar issues, and that is that you uh, have casualties, that you have uh, uh, broken and lost uh, equipment, and that you are running low on ammunition. And I think that is on both sides happening. Uh, what is... Uh, uh, one of the miscalculations of, uh, of the Russian uh, operational or even strategic planners in the beginning was because they thought it was a three-day war, they um, forgot to inform a number of people in the execution. They actually um, didn't have their logistics in place. After a couple of days, they ran out of fuel with the tank army. That is not because they don't have fuel in Russia, but because they had it in the wrong place. So logistics is every war after, let's say, four, five, six days becomes about logistics. And that's what you see in, um, in, in Ukraine. And, uh, and that has a connection to other issues that we have as well, which is the uh, ability in your society to actually produce everything that you have lost, like ammunition, like new vehicles, like new artillery pieces, like new tanks. Um, let alone new people, but that's a different production uh, cycle. But I mean, that is about mobilization and uh, about conscription and that sort of thing. So you need to find ways to find new people as well for your armed forces. Uh, but on the, on, the, on, the, on the materiel side, you actually see that uh, the Russians are now starting to use very old material, very old capabilities, uh, the T-54 tanks that we now see in the battlefield, the T-54 the is actually related to the, 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 the year of design, 1954. But the problem is they still have a lot of T-54s. So it is still, in terms of numbers, quantity, it is an issue. Uh, and I think um, that is what we will see now, is that the, the, uh, the, the Russians will focus, have to focus on quantity, larger number of conscripts and mobilized people, not well trained, older material, but large numbers, and not as precise and not as good as the newer ones, and that the Ukrainians focus on quality uh, with Western weapon systems and uh, Western training. That's the big difference in the coming months, I would say. I, I would add that the um, degradation of the Russian armed forces is very uneven. It's predominantly in the ground forces, of course, which is why most of Admiral Bauer's uh, examples were probably from that. In, in other domains, um, the degradation has been much less noticeable. Thank you very much. We have just a couple more minutes. I'm scanning the room. 
Yes. Can you please state your outlet, please? Elin Sørstal from TV2 Norway. Uh, Ukraine still asks for more weapon, uh, ammunition, uh, fighter planes. Uh, what was the message you could give to Ukraine today? It's a question for uh, the Admiral, but uh, everyone can weigh in. Well, actually, um, it wasn't discussed today the exact uh, uh, amounts of things that, uh, uh, that Ukraine wants, because NATO is not the coordinating body when it comes to uh, the requests from Ukraine and uh, uh, the offers of the nations, the 50 nations. That is happening in the Ukraine Defense Contact Group, organized through the United States in Europe. Uh, and uh, so that is not a NATO effort, and therefore it was not in, in particular discussed today. No, we didn't uh, discuss fighter planes in, in, in that sense, so, uh, so, so the answer is no, we didn't discuss that. Okay, and then we just have one final question, Terry schultz Deutschewelle. Thank you very much. Um, with your top two priorities today and in the new planning being Russia and terrorism, um, it strikes me that you haven't even mentioned China today. And one of the, the threats um, may be that while NATO is completely focused on Russia and terrorism, on refilling its stockpiles, on sending everything it has to Ukraine, that China doesn't have to worry about any of these things. And of course, um, can sit back and, and build its arsenal without um, any drain on it like this. So how concerned are you that, um, that perhaps you're focusing, um, I wouldn't say too much, but, but that you're, you're, you're not looking enough at what threats China may pose? And when one of those threats is something that we never saw coming, um, for example, in Norway, where they're using electricity for a TikTok um, facility that, you know, that's something certainly a, a, a sort of infrastructure um, a hurdle that couldn't, wasn't foreseen. Well, as you know, uh, NATO sees China not as a threat, but as a challenge. And, uh, and, the, and the difference is when we talk about these uh, military plans is that NATO is not working on military plans against China. We are working on military plans against Russia and the terrorist groups. That's where the plans are focusing on. That is where the force structure requirements are focusing on. That doesn't mean that there are allies in the alliance that also look at China and are planning on that as well. But that is not a collective effort uh, based on the policy decisions that was, take, that was taken by the leaders in, in Madrid. Uh, so that is, the, that is the answer to your question. Um, uh, there, there's a lot of what ifs in your questions and of course uh, you, can, you can think of all sorts of uh, concerns with regard to China, but there, in, in terms of military threat, we did not have that discussion today. If, if, I, if I may, just speaking about strategic competition, uh, and I spoke about a little bit uh, uh, in, my, in my speech, so I think that the, the aim is to keep the edge, uh, NATO edge in uh, strategic competition. And the first thing is to understand better, so it's why we need this digital transformation. And uh, we need to share uh, more and more uh, data among, um, among us and our partners. And uh, I will offer you the opportunity to read our uh, uh, very new, very, very soon, uh, non-classified uh, version of our uh, uh, NATO warfighting captain concept. Thank you, Thank you all very much. I'm afraid that's all we have time for today. We will end this pro uh, press conference with one final statement from Admiral Bauer. Yes, um, I thank you all for your presence here in the room and online. And as we said, this new era of collective defense is not just about physically protecting one billion citizens, but also about upholding the democratic values we all hold dear. The free and independent press plays a big role in that. And you have an immense responsibility in the global quest for truth by combating disinformation you increase the resilience of our citizens. Yesterday, 
a French AFP journalist was killed by rocket fire in Ukraine while he was trying to tell the world of the plight of the Ukrainian soldiers. The price for truth can be immeasurably high. And I thank you for the work that you do. Thank you for challenging us. That is exactly how it should be until the next time.